Friends, good afternoon. The subject of today's uh, Global Health History Seminar is Global Public Health, Social Media and Research, Opportunities and Ethical Challenges. The Global Health History Seminars were, series was established in late 2004 and is hosted jointly by WHO and WHO Collaborating Center for Global Health Histories at the University of York. Seminars take place once every month and are broadcasted via the internet. I'm honored to introduce my co-chair, Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya, Director of WHO Collaborating Center at the University of York, Dr. Alexander Metcalf, Outreach Historian of the Center, and our two speakers, Dr. Dan O'Connor, Head of uh, Humanities Humanities and Social Science at the, World, uh, at the Wellcome Trust, and Dr. Abba Saxena, Coordinator of Global Health Ethics at the Knowledge, Ethics and Research Department of the World Health Organization. Each of the two presentations will last for about 25 minutes, followed by Q&A session uh, uh, for, both, for both speakers, which will be chaired by Professor Bhattacharya. Kindly remind everybody to speak into a microphone and mention your names, please, as the seminar will be broadcasted. Our first speaker is Dr. Dan O'Connor from the Wellcome Trust. The Wellcome Trust is the world's third largest charitable foundation and is dedicated to achieving extraordinary improvements in human and animal health. Dr. O'Connor oversees the Trust Medical Humanities, Bioethics, and the Social Science Research Portfolios. Previously, he was a member of the Bioethics Faculty at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, MD, and before that, he was a social media consultant in London, UK. Dr. O'Connor, please. Thank you, Jane. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to start my time. There we go. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Dan O'Connor, as Jane said, and I'm here from uh, the Wellcome Trust in London. I just want to start with um, some thank yous. Thank you, as always, to Sanjoy uh, and to Alex for inviting me. Thank you to Jane for that very generous introduction. And thank you to Abha, as well, um, for uh, agreeing to talk about social media and ethics with me uh, today. So my first question uh, to you is, um, who thinks, who here is on Facebook? Who here is on Facebook right now? Okay, good. Who here is on Twitter? Right now, okay. Excellent. <laughs> who thinks Facebook and Twitter are the work of the devil? Mm, a couple of scared hands. <laughs> um, so what I'm gonna talk to you today is a little bit about the way that social media has changed the way medical and health research can be done and some of the ethical and moral challenges that those changes uh, present to us. So some of you will recall perhaps um, this uh, a minor scandal that occurred uh, a couple of months ago when it transpired that Facebook had been manipulating um, users' Facebook pages, their Facebook feeds, to show them different types of stories to see if they could manipulate their emotions. It's a piece of classic psychological behavioral research, basically. Facebook had been changing what you see uh, in your Facebook page. They didn't ask users for their permission to do this. They never told the users that they were going to do this, but it actually produced some really interesting um, results. It turns out you can manipulate people's emotions by showing them different types uh, of emotionally charged story. Now, to lots of people, uh, lots of regular Facebook users, this was just part of the course. Facebook is constantly changing its rules and regulations. But for those of us who work in research ethics, it was really exciting. Uh, in those ways that research scandals are exciting to those of us who do ethics. Um, because it seemed to me to be a classic case of a breach of research ethics. Here it is, people are not being given, able to give their informed consent. They're not aware that they're part of a study that has set out to manipulate the way they feel. Facebook was deliberately potentially upsetting people. So obviously huge amounts of ethical problems in the research there. Um, the thing with Facebook and the way, the reason that I think what we're talking about today is about global 
uh, public health, is that Facebook has almost as many countries using it as the WHO has member states. Okay? It has more than a billion users. It has hundreds of millions of users who use Facebook every day. And the social media platforms that I'm going to be talking about today have truly global reach, almost radical in the way that they break down barriers between nations and between international organizations, the way they permit communication and the exchange, crucially, as we'll see later on, of health information. So this is the uh, quick outline of my talk. Talk a little bit, I'm going to give a, a very vulgar history of the emergence of research ethics. Um, give you a quick whistle-stop tour of what social media is, and then talk about APO mediation, which is this interesting technical term that we've been, uh, that colleagues and I have been using to describe uh, some of the ethical challenges. Look at the uses of social media in health research, um, and then talk a little bit about some of those ethical challenges that arise. Oops. So, um, there is a classic story that bioethicists tell ourselves in our history of how research ethics arises, which is that basically for centuries, physicians and researchers are basically allowed to do what they like, completely unchecked, and they go about their business violating people's rights and doing extraordinarily bad things until the 1970s, um, essentially the late 1960s, 1970s, when a series of public scandals, particularly in the United States, um, and it's interesting that the story is often told from an American point of view, which is sometimes thought to be sort of imperialist bioethics from the United States. So the classic story is, of course, the Tuskegee um, uh, story, um, where men in uh, Macon County, Alabama, uh, in the south of the United States, were deliberately denied treatment for syphilis so that the U.S. Public Health Authority could run um, a study in nature of the spread of syphilis. This um, continued, they continued to be denied treatment even after penicillin was discovered to be um, an excellent uh, cure for syphilis. Clearly scandalous, clearly unethical. And it was various stories like that, repeated sets of um, violations of people's apparent rights, that bioethicists tell ourselves led to the birth of research ethics. That bioethics comes in on its white horse, it creates the Belmont Commission, um, the, the, the Tom Beecham Report and things like that, that are there and they give us these great classic ideas of informed consent of beneficence and of justice and fair subject selection, all of which have been sort of violated by things like the Tuskegee study. And what all of these, um, these scandalous things have in common, which also sort of reach back to things like classically the, the Nazi experiments during, during World War II, is that they rely upon an intermediated system of healthcare research. So um, let's take the Tuskegee one as an example. There were the subjects the men of Macon County, Alabama. There were the researchers, the men and women from the United States Public Health Information uh, Authority. And then there was the information about the research protocol. Now, the men of Macon County, Alabama, the subjects, did not know anything more about the research protocol than they were able, ever told by the researchers. The researchers never told them that they were being denied the best possible treatment. They never told them about the various risks and things like that. So this is the intermediated system. Subjects need to go through researchers to get to the research protocol information. And it's basically this system that governs the way, or I, I suggest, this is the system that has up until now governed the way we think about research ethics. That there's an intermediated system through which the subjects, the participants, or the volunteers must go through the researcher in order to get access to information about the risks and benefits, et cetera, of um, the protocol that they're about to become a part of. This creates, of course, a huge power differential between researchers and subjects. And it's my uh, proposition that it's that power differential which is the primary concern of research ethics, the differential in power between, in terms of knowledge, in terms of practice, between the researchers and their subjects. And the whole point of research ethics for the last sort of 50 years or so, um, 40, 50 years or so, has been about mitigating that power differential. So we go back to this. It's about mitigating the idea that a healthcare researcher has lots of power potentially over that subject. And that power is easily either purposefully or accidentally. But either way, it can be abused. So that's what research ethics is there for. Things like informed consent, things like an insistence on beneficence, and things like an insistence on justice and fair subject selection. All of those are there to mitigate 
against that power differential. That's the background. Social media 101. So this is where we are now with that place where research ethics is about mitigating power differentials. We live in a world now which is diffuse and completely um, sort of saturated with social media. It's amazing. If you think about just 10 years, the very idea of being on Facebook, the very idea of Twitter, and of being able to carry our cell phones and mobile phones around everywhere, was, was completely out of it. We weren't even there yet. So much has changed in the last 10 years that I don't think we've actually had time to really sit and think about how much the world genuinely has changed because of social media. Um, and I sometimes get a little bit carried away with this, but I think genuinely the last 10 years have seen as much change in terms of the way information is shared as the print revolution did um, in the 16th century. I genuinely believe that this is, we are in the midst of a sort of revolution. Um, legal scholars call these things periods of transitional justice, where everything's changing. Things like the decline of the Roman Empire, the decline of the Roman Republic when it became an empire, or the American Wild West in the 19th century. These are times when no one really knows what's going on. We know something's changing, but it's big and we're part of the change. So what is changing? Social media basically allows us, anyone with internet access, and that's really quite a lot of people these days. That's, there isn't, there's almost no country in the world, there's nowhere in the world where you can't get some kind of access to the internet. It allows you to create, share, recommend, and filter information. It allows you, it allows individuals to create, share, recommend, and filter their information. So examples of creation of information. Um, here are my old colleagues from um, the uh, University of Johns Hopkins. They have a blog where they blog about bioethics. They creating information. Here's the uh, Public Library of Science Twitter feed, again, creating uh, information. What do you do with that information? You share it. Here's Professor Michelle Mayer, a former colleague of mine, who uses Facebook and Twitter a lot to share her own research, to share health in, healthcare information. And there's, again, colleagues of mine from the Berman Institute sharing not just their own information, but other people's uh, interesting uh, thoughts that they've had around ethics. And you can recommend it as well. Who's liked anything on Facebook today? Anyone? Um, who's ever liked anything on Facebook? Right? It's just become, what would, if 10 years ago, that was such a bizarre idea. Like something, constantly liking things and approving of it and rating it and giving it five stars or three stars or one stars or no stars at all and then writing a really rude review on Amazon. This has all completely changed the way we interact with information. So you're allowed to recommend or you're able to recommend information. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, you're able to filter it. So we create information, we share it, we recommend it to people, but then we filter it. Then we decide what we want to see. We get to pick and choose what sorts of information we look to. And the change here is from pull to push. Before social media, for the most part, our interactions with information was about pulling it down from recognized sources, about going through recognized inter intermediaries physicians, researchers, newspapers, mass media organizations, encyclopedias, things like that. We were pulling information down. Social media allows us to push it out. We now are the people who create the information. There are no, we're not, those intermediaries between us and the information have sort of been washed out of the picture, which is kind of scary for people whose jobs and power depends upon being the intermediary between people and health information in particular. And this has its sort of, um, its, its, its biggest play in the, the creation and emergence of networks and communities online that are run like networks and communities we've seen previously because they do not necessarily depend on geographical boundedness. These are communities that reach across towns, villages, cities, countries, continents. As I've said before, all they require is a broadband or even dial-up internet connection. The obvious ones are things like Facebook and Twitter, which you know, at least 50% of the people in this room have participated in. And these are the sort of generic communities where you can be, it's, on Facebook, it's your friends and family, that's the community. But there are also um, pop groups, films, sports clubs, and things like that, that you can become part of a community of on Facebook. There are really interesting research communities on Twitter. A lot of academics and research now use Twitter to ask one another and to talk to one another and to do networking around their particular areas of academic interest. And what's critical about these communities is that the barrier to entry is almost non-existent. There's a very, very low barrier to entering social media communities. And what this has resulted in is much more specialized communities. 
from those big generic ones, those big sort of billion member potential communities like Facebook and Twitter. We have here communities that are dedicated around uh, or formed around particular disease conditions, particular health conditions. So here are two nice examples. Um, Diabetic Connect, um, which is a social network for people with uh, diabetes. Um, and they're lay people with diabetes, not necessarily doctors or physicians or nurses. And they're there sharing their lived experience. Um, they're exchanging uh, recipes. They're exchanging lifestyle tips. They're sympathizing. They're exchanging their stories. Um, and below it, you see the Cancer Survivors Network, uh, which is uh, uh, an American uh, website for people with cancer. And again, it's lay people with cancer. It's not for physicians. It's not for nurses. It's not for researchers. It's for people who either themselves have cancer or whose families and friends have got cancer. And they're there exchanging information. And what's fascinating about both of these communities is that the information being exchanged between lay people is done horizontally. It's not intermediated about expertise. It's about different forms of expertise. So the kind of thing that the Survivors Network, the Cancer Survivors Network talk about isn't always about the protocols and the drugs and the diagnoses. It's about where's the best place to park at this hospital where I have to go and have chemotherapy? Where's a cheap hotel to stay? How do I deal with my husband's depression because he's just had a diagnosis of prostate cancer? All these things that doctors and researchers aren't focused on, but which people who actually live with these diseases every day. And what social media allows is for everyday expertise to be shared around the world. The lived experience of health, ill health and disease is shared very easily through social media. And what this results in, or what this has resulted in, is um, a real excitement around that easy flow of information. Because it suddenly occurs to people that, well, we've got all these people with particular diseases, particular health conditions. They're all there. They're all willingly exchanging health information with one another. They're all willingly talking about their disease. They're all able to do this because social media, the platforms, the digital platforms, the internet enables this to happen fairly frictionlessly. Is there something more we can do with that? And thus the rise of social media-based healthcare research. Um, and these are just two platforms uh, that I, I often use as an example. At the bottom here is Inspire, which is a platform for helping people find um, research protocols that may be of benefit to them, right? It's about exchanging information. It's about someone will say, my doctor has just recommended this to me. I've got this condition. You've got this condition. Have you thought about joining this protocol? Patients like me, has anyone heard of patients like me? Okay, patients like me are a really exciting um, and interesting organization, very much at the cutting edge of what we're talking about today. Um, it started off, uh, it was founded by um, some, uh, uh, two brothers. Um, the third, their third brother died of ALS, of Lou Gehrig's uh, syndrome, most known, a motor neuron disease. And they were very, very frustrated by how slow research was on ALS. It's very difficult to get enough people and enough data together to do any kind of meaningful research. They were computer scientists, and they were using social media, and it suddenly occurs to them that why don't we have a platform where people who've got ALS can exchange their information amongst each other, right? If this is the problem, if the problem is not being able to share the information, because we don't know everyone is, let's present the patients themselves who want, excuse me, to share their information. Let's give them the opportunity to do so. And so patients like me do that. And it's not just for ALS anymore. It's for almost every disease condition um, you can imagine. And the fascinating thing about patients like me is that people are willingly doing it. The patients who are going on there are exchanging all their, not every single piece of health information, but stuff that previously we might have thought was considered private, that we have gone out of our way as ethicists to protect people from having people know about their health information. They're up there online sharing it. And it's not just an American thing, right? Things like patients like me are happening in countries all over. Um, the world. Further interest around patients like me is that it's a for-profit organization. They're not a charity. Um, they're not an NGO. They are a for-profit. Um, and they make their money by selling that health information. And this is where lots of ethicists go, Ooh, profiting from health information. That's bad, right? We don't like that. Except it turns out that all the patients on there, they know that because you can't get to put your health information up there without seeing this one big page, which I should have got a a screenshot of which says, we're going to sell your information. That's how this works. It will be anonymized, but we sell your information. That's how we do this. And people sign up in their tens of thousands because these are people who've got particular disease conditions where the research isn't perhaps going as fast as they might like. And so they're quite happy 
that their information, their health information should be sold on because they want the research to happen. They feel empowered, and this is a crucial thing, by being able um, to share their information. So already, as you can see, the ethical issues start to become quite cloudy, quite murky, because on the one hand, we've all grown up in a, a sort of ethical structure where we are we're sort of inculcated. It's our instincts, perhaps, to, to protect information, to protect privacy. But here we've got people saying, I don't want my privacy protected. I want to give my information away so that I can be in charge. Or I can contribute to making this disease condition better. Um, and within these, um, within these communities, there are different types of research um, that's been going, just checking the time. Um, and these are sort of, you can group social media research into about four, four categories. One, surveillance, two, recruitment, three, participation platforms, and then patient-led research. Surveillance is fascinating because um, whilst everyone's out there sharing information on public social networks, it means you can actually have your information read by people who you might not necessarily have intended. Share it with. So this is a lovely story um, that I've been uh, sort of telling for a few years now. Um, Jane Manley is a, um, a kidney patient, and um, she uses Twitter. She'd used Twitter quite a lot to talk to other kidney patients because dialysis and things like that can be quite isolating. Spend a lot of time on your own, often housebound, as difficult to get. So used Twitter to chat to other people with it, and it was all. Um, and she, what she didn't know though was her doctor was monitoring what she wrote on Twitter. Okay, was surveilling what she was writing. And she goes in for a checkup one day and he actually says, what you were saying yesterday was wrong. Right? Actually, what you had been writing on Twitter was not accurate about um, the, the actual the, the treatment that we'd suggested. She took it with good humor, right? But you can imagine how worrying it is that if your doctor starts reading your Twitter feed or your Facebook page. I went out, for, Sanjay took it out for dinner last night and I had pig's trotters. And I wonder what, if I had a cardiologist, what she would think about me eating all this meat and fried food and things like that, if she was monitoring my Twitter page all the time, right? So this information's out there, but who's reading it is the interesting question. But it affords us all sorts of exciting things. You'll know that the Centers for Disease Control increasingly use the surveillance of social media to track the spread of diseases, and in some cases, even to predict outbreaks uh, and things like that. Um, but some people find this very, very disturbing. This is a, a quotation from a group of um, uh, writers who had been using um, a particular blogging network uh, to write very particular stories and to share um, uh, was, uh, they were very, very sort of uh, outliers in, in their communities, and they were writing different stories that were quite sort of quite radical, quite interesting, quite um, politically charged. Um, and people tried to, a group of American researchers tried to do some researchers on them. And this is what they said, these social media users. We decline to be interviewed by you. We decline to be the objects of your fascination. We decline to be naturalized. We decline to allow our political project to be cited in the support of the very discourses we're trying to question. And I'm always reminded when people get, when health reachers get really excited about social media and doing the surveillance, about the way, it, it, there's something slightly Victorian and slightly colonial about it. Look, all these interesting people. Let's go and do some research on them. We've heard that story before, right? Where people with lots of power try and go do research. The interesting thing here is that these guys, because they're online, have got the power to say no, right? Because it's not that intermediated thing anymore. It's got a little bit flatter. Recruitment is great. Social media is brilliant for recruiting patients. It's really, really impressive. Um, so you can use it yourself as a researcher to recruit patients. But what's actually happening, and what's a little bit scary for some researchers, is that the patients are recruiting themselves. Okay? They are forming viable research cohorts and doctor shopping. They're going around and finding people who they think can run good protocols. So a great story of this was um, uh, at the Mayo Clinic in the United States. Severe coronary artery dissection is a very serious, very rare condition. It largely affects uh, middle-aged women. And because it's rare, it's quite difficult to get a proper cohort of people together to do research on. Um, and so uh, uh, an SCAD patient started using Facebook and other forms of social media to get other women with SCAD together. And she, I think, eventually assembled something like 60 of them, right, which is a viable enough cohort to do some biographical based research. And she said she went to a conference, went to a, a professor, a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic, and said, I've got 60 people here, all of whom are willing to share their biographical and health information with you if you want to do some preliminary studies. What a gift, <laughs> what an amazing gift. But the question then becomes, does everyone in that community know what they're getting into? 
they've not been through any kind of informed consent protocol. Right? They're there. They're just, they just decided they want to be part of this research. And they would feel, and they have felt, that they would be slowed down by the kind of regulation um, that go on. It eventually resulted in uh, community-initiated studies. You can see that, which is uh, published in Mayo Clinic proceedings. Participation platforms. Um, this is another one where these ones are actually often for um, healthy people. So it's anyone, does anyone here ever sort of use RunKeeper or anything like that? Anyone monitor their heart rate a lot or how much they've been running and things like that? So we're all part of that sort of self-monitoring, self-surveillance society, weighing ourselves and everything. This is, you can put all your data up online and share it with everybody else um, so that you can do your own little research projects about you and yourself and people with similar demographic profiles. Um, but the place I want to sort of, um, I've got about, I think, five minutes, three minutes now, um, to, to finish up with is about patient-led research. And this is where the sort of ethical uh, rubber hits the road, as it were, and we come back to patients uh, like me. Um, what patients like me um, has always done is enabled their, their members to share their health information. And, and what happened a, a few years ago is the, um, there was an Italian study which suggested that lithium, uh, sorry, um, lithium was a good, uh, a potential, not a cure, but it, it ameliorated the symptoms of ALS, the Lou Gehrig syndrome, that it could actually uh, alleviate some of the pain. So it was a minus, a small study published in an Italian journal. And so various members of the ALS community, lay members, of the ALS community at PLM decided that they would conduct their own study of how lithium worked. So they assembled themselves into a group. They got their doctors to prescribe them lithium off-label. Um, and then they used a patient matching algorithm to do a sort of an, an algorithmic exploration of whether lithium actually did make any difference. And it turns out that according to their study, it didn't. And this was then published uh, in Nature Biotech, which is a serious peer-reviewed journal, okay? So this is the patients doing the research, right? They decided on the protocol. They worked with people at patients like me. They made sure that there was some ethical review because they wanted to publish it, but it was led by the patients. The patients were the researchers, okay? So in intermediation, we're used to there being subjects, researchers, and the protocol information, but that doesn't work for that ALS study from patients like me because the research protocol information the subjects are the researchers. That's the end of my <laughs> If I can have two more minutes, is that right? So the researchers and the subjects are the same people. So remember, our, all, our current system, healthcare ethics, is about protecting subjects from researchers, basically. It's about mediating, or mitigating, rather, that balance of power, that power differential. But the question really for us is, when the subjects and the research are the same, where is the power differential that we are trying to mitigate? How do we, in, in, in what role do we have to play as ethicists in protecting people from themselves, okay? These people feel like they are empowered to do their own health research. Under what kind of ethical framework are we there to regulate them? How does that work? Because it doesn't feel like this. It feels like APA mediation. Instead of there being someone between you and the information, it's your friends, it's your peers, it's peer to peer, it's horizontal. The Latin APA to stand by. And it means it's more like this, subjects, apomediaries, who are also subjects, also researchers. And you're all together forming the information yourself. So from whom are we as ethicists? Or what is our role as ethicists in this, in this place? Should we be trying to enable this kind of research? Is it morally right that actually we should be helping this happen? We should be encouraging this sort of thing? Or do we think there are potential dangers and conflicts that may arise within these communities? Um, and I'll just run through a couple of those now before I finish. So within an apomediated network, where everyone is supposedly is a peer, all these lay people are peers, there may be people in networks. We've all been part of friendship groups where some people are more influential than others, right? That some people follow, some people lead. That may happen. And when some of the leaders perhaps are not being fair, not being honest, there can be conflicts of interest within the group. Um, the question also has to be, who's going to benefit from this kind of research? Do you have to be a member of the community? Do you have to take risks? Is there the possibility of being bullied or pressured by other apomediaries into participating in potentially risky research? So do the ethics and regulations born in response to intermediate systems pertain in the apomediated world? When social media is changing the way health information is exchanged, and because research regulations and ethics have been about regulating this vertical system, what happens when things are flat? 
And I don't really have an answer yet to it because that is, as I said, we're living in this period of extraordinary change. And what's very exciting to me is that the World Health Organization has taken this opportunity today to start talking about these problems and to actually start um, to address them. Because believe you me, there's gonna be more and more of this participant-led research. Social media is gonna really open up the way we exchange health information. And the power differentials that we used to be concerned uh, with mitigating against are really being uh, flattened out quite a lot. So that is um, my talk. I would have gone on for another 28 days if I'd been allowed, but um, so these are my contact details. That's my Twitter feed if you want to follow me. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. O'Connor. Um, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. So now, uh, the second, our second speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Abba Saxena, an anesthesiologist and a specialist in pain and palliative care by training. In 2001, Dr. Abba Saxena relocated from New Delhi, India to join the research policy department of the World Health Organization, in which department she re-established the research ethics review committee of the organization, WHO ERC, and led efforts to develop norms and standards for research ethics committees. And the training tools in the area of research ethics, now situated, situa situated in the knowledge ethics and the research department since 2013, she is coordinating WHO's work on bioethics, bio public health, and research ethics, including the Secretariat of the ERC and the Global Summit of National Bioethics Adversary Bodies. Dr. Saxena, the floor is all yours, please. Thank you, Jing, uh, the organizer of the Global Health History Seminars in WHO, uh, as well as thank you to Sanjoy uh, from the University of York and Dan, Welcome Trust, and Alex also from the University of York. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and talking about this very interesting topic. But uh, when I undertook and when I agreed with Dan, we had this very exciting conversation, I think, earlier this year. Uh, I don't think I fully realized the challenge that I set myself up for. <laughs> uh, because for me, the issue of social networking was very interesting, challenging. It was opening up new vistas and we hadn't explored them and it was a good opportunity. Um, and especially uh, of its intersection with health research because that was even less explored. Um, but uh, it's a very uncharted territory. And when I started preparing for this talk, um, I didn't know, as, I, as Dan said, you could take 28 days. So I said, well, it's only 25 minutes. So we have to see, okay, what am I going to talk about? How am I going to focus this talk? What is the thing that's interesting and that can actually put the focus on what we are doing? So what I've decided to do is uh, to, and, and actually, Dan has made my task easier because a lot of what I'm saying has already been covered, so I'll probably go through it quite quickly. But to, so to see what are the opportunities offered by social networking media in uh, support of health research. And then to use this, and then using privacy as an example to demonstrate that we need to do much more in terms of regulation uh, for research in this area. What I want to be talking about uh, is internet-based internet research, because you can use the internet to do health research, uh, but that's not the topic of this discussion today. So we're not talking about research, uh, online surveys, online interviews, focus group discussions, etc. What we are talking about is the use of social media to conduct health research. And by social media, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as websites and applications that enable users to create and share content or to participate in social networking. So like all the examples that Dan provided. Uh, it's 
a site which is generally distinguished by the creation of individual public profiles and multi-directional communication and collaboration, which allows users to connect to one another within the site. And the sites are not located by geographical boundaries. So the sites are, as, as we heard, they, they cross boundaries of countries and continents. And public health researchers and practitioners are interested in the use of SNSs, I'll call them social networking sites, precisely because of this nature of, of, the, of theirs. There's a quick and inexpensive access to a broad or a specific population, depending upon who your, uh, what your uh, population of interest is, so that they afford, uh, they, they, they have the possibility for multi-directional communication that they offer. So, so it's, it's, it's very helpful to public health researchers. The advantage of SNSs in public health research is that you can replace the traditionally resource-heavy methods that are required in-person participant recruitment. It's so much easier. You just click online and you find out your population of interest. You can actually reach certain vulnerable populations who may have the greatest need of services, but they never come to the health facilities. Uh, the large user population and immediate nature of social networking sites have the pop potential to increase the reach of the public. And very importantly, uh, they reduce the bias between researchers and participants. If you're face to face with the participants, sometimes you know there are uh, social or behavioral uh, things that 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 start get into play, and you may lose participants just because sometimes you don't like the way they talk, you don't like their face, you don't like their behavior, you have uh, interactional problems, and that's that's reduced. The problem with using social networking sites is that it assumes near total participation by everyone. And of course, that's not true. Uh, we did, uh, Dan did mention that uh, uh, internet reaches everywhere, but it doesn't. The speed of internet is very slow in many countries, so they may or may not be able to get onto social networking sites if they can have email is good enough. Um, the poor people don't have access to it. The illiterate people don't have access to it. So we are, there is a question of representativeness. And we do exclude many groups. Uh, the ones who are vulnerable, in some respect, we do achieve to, we do manage to get them. But in other respects, we may not actually get to the vulnerable population because they're not even using the, uh, these sites. And there may be important group differences between those who are included in social networking services uh, uh, sites versus those who are not. So the type of people who don't use social networks, the people who didn't raise their hands for Facebook, perhaps there's something we are missing by not including them and getting conclusions, making conclusions about, about health issues that may or may not be tenable. What are the various ways that uh, social networking sites have been used for doing research? I think it's, I'm going through a little bit of what Dan already said to recruit participants. For example, Facebook, uh, for example, investigators use Facebook to identify college freshmen of a particular age group and then invited them for interviews on health and substance abuse. So it was just for purposes of recruitment. But you can also use Facebook or other networking sites to improve understanding of health behavior or expectations, uh, for example, to do health promotion. And this has been used by investigators, for example, to analyze the profiles of teenagers regarding alcohol abuse to help identify effective strategies for modifying risk behavior. And the sort of information that they could get from MySpace and the sort of things that teenagers had written on that, they would have never told investigators in face-to-face -face interviews or in surveys or, or by in focus group discussions. So it was a very rich data that they could get from these websites and uh, could actually use it for health promotion. So it was a great thing to do. You could implement a social networking site to actually do your study. So investigators designed an interactive website for adolescents to retrieve information regarding health-related issues and facilitate exchange among them. It's interesting to note a lot of the studies are done on adolescents or teenagers, I guess because that's the 
population that's most on the net on on the social networking side. Uh, then social network analysis. This is the method to map and measure relationships and flows between people, groups, organizations, computers, links, etc. What it does is to identify the, using uh, specific analysis. It actually identifies who are the leaders in the group, who are the followers in the group, who are the people who who are uh, creating new. Uh, uh, let's say new ways of thinking and then for the people who actually get more people to follow them so you can actually see how does this whole group you know what are the dynamics within the group and you can use this has been used in um, it, to study for example the spread of contagious diseases mental health social support etc in the area of health uh, it has interesting implications because Doing social network analysis, you can actually identify people who are leading efforts within the community or within that particular social group, and it can have implications in some cases. Uh, we also know that the internet has provided huge, huge opportunities to practitioners and to healthcare systems to support patient-centered healthcare. So you can use the internet to actually develop websites, and we've seen examples where uh, patient centered healthcare can be provided. And what one of the authors has said in 2013, he said, they said patient-centered healthcare, social media, and the internet, they're beginning to come together with powerful and unpredictable consequences. We believe that they had the potential to create a major shift in how patients and healthcare organizations connect. And they call it the perfect storm, a phrase that has been used to describe a situation in which a rare combination of circumstances result in an event of unusual magnitude, creating the potential for nonlinear change. So I think I'm sort of repeating a little bit of what you were saying in different terms. Um, and then just a few words about uh, combining big data with social network uh, sites. I think big data is another uh, uh, phrase and another activity that actually sends shivers down the spines of ethicists because, oh my God, there are so many, um, so much is being done with data that's collected in different domains and then we're trying to mix up all the data. And you actually end up combining large volumes of structured and destructured data series into one big place. And the it has a huge potential to give you a lot of information which you cannot get from each of the data sets individually. On the other hand, we have the social networking sites, which also have, uh, which are also sharing a lot of health information, but which is not structured and which is not necessarily scientific, which is not necessarily um, having the base that the big data people have. But if you combine the two, and then you can actually get, uh, you you may have the potential to really reveal clinical data that wasn't cannot be done through usual textbooks and usual journals and manuals that we have. But what what are the issues with all the sort of information? And you can glean some of the uh, issues that I was talking about when, uh, when I discussed these various uses that social networking is used for. Uh, first question, first issue is uh, confidentiality, anonymity, and protection of the subjects. Uh, people say that usually we are, we are protect, we are usually uh, anonymizing uh, the information. So people cannot be identified when we present our research using social network sites. That is true, but if you are that if you if you look for Google direct quotes from whatever is published, you may be able to actually find out who said what. And maybe there is an obligation to paraphrase what was uh, present what is presented when you present research results. But also if the subsamples are small enough and the right information is provided in combination, individuals can be identified. And this happened in 2010 from a Facebook study on behavior of college students. The authors argued that they had, and they didn't provide the name of the college, they didn't provide the names of students, they didn't provide information about students. But the way that the information was provided within a very short time, people who were reviewing and analyzing the study could actually honed down to the fact that this happened in Harvard Medical School and it, these were the students who were involved, this is the batch this was involved. There was only one student 
in that year from Iran. There was only one from Albania. So you know who it is. And then when you start putting things together and say what are their habits, what are their beliefs, what are their systems, and then it can create some problems. Then one further issue which is in the other direction, when people say something on Facebook, they expect not to be anonymized. They're looking for, they're looking to, to make a statement and they want to be quoted. And then when you say, oh, we're not going to quote you, we're just going to anonymize you. Say, well, that's not what I wanted and that's not fair. Then uh, related again to privacy, uh, according to these authors in 2014, Khan et al, large-scale social computing research offers an environment that combines features of seemingly private behavior, so it's seemingly private, public speech, social psychology research, and innovative technology development. And what this means is that the question then is, is the, media, is the information displayed on social media? Is it private or is it public? And people have coined the phrase privately public or publicly private. And it has connotations because uh, if you go, you know, we don't know what the rules for privacy are anymore. If it's privately public, then what rules apply? Or publicly private, what rules apply? And going back to the study, the Facebook uh, social computing research that you mentioned as well, where emotions of people were uh, manipulated in a way by filtering out some things and not filtering out others. The Facebook users were furious. They said, you have no business. This is our private space. And you, no one has a business to, to meddle with it. But it was not private in that sense because it was publicly available in, at one level. So uh, th th there is an issue about whether you can, what's, what's private and what's public. Then the question is whether they feel that when people use social media network, and, and I've seen this you know, as examples when you talk to friends or you talk to college students, kids, and they say, well, this is our space. This is something we want to express ourselves the way we want to. And that's why there is this huge problem with Facebook where since the older generation has started using Facebook as well, the uh, younger generation has started moving out of Facebook because they find that their, what they wanted to discuss in a private space has been invaded by, by the adults. And so the question is, if we start using the information available publicly on Facebook or on these social media networks, are we violating their expectation of privacy, which is not private, but the expectation is that they would like that to be, that's the way they would like it to be. Another issue that is important is that the social network sites, and as Dan also mentioned, they're they are privately owned. They're not, most of them are not public endeavors. And public health research is a public good. So here we have a private endeavor which is going by its own rules and regulations, and then public health research which has its own rules and regulations. And we don't know what the, where, whether they meet together or not. So there is, they, I don't think that all of us are sharing the same values, principles, and goals. As a result of this uh, whole furor about the Facebook social computing research, uh, Facebook and, and other social networking sites actually came up very quickly with statements saying, oh yes, I think we do need ethical guidelines. And we are going to put up, we are going to start developing ethics guidelines to guide our research but we don't know what those guidelines are. And as public health professionals, it would be good to know either what the guidelines are or to actually work with them to say that these are guidelines that we all can accept. And we need to know whose rules will apply. I just want to use one more example of um, the same issue about private and public uh, uh, collaboration and where again, we don't know whose guidelines apply. So when we are doing data mining, in, when we're combining big data from various uh, databases, uh, we know that non-identifiable can become identifiable. So that's one issue. Uh, but it has, uh, it does represent a resource with the potential to, to ha further human development and humanitarian practice. But the problem, and this is what 
the people who are in determining find its privacy risks are a key concern. And some of the concerns relate to the absence of unified legal and ethical frameworks. Uh, the responsible and feasible mechanisms around big data access and lack of anonymization standards. So even people who are working in this area recognize that there is a need to uh, to standardize and to have standards around uh, privacy and, and anonymization. And then there is this new word that I read, which is uh, it's always good when you when you learn something new on a, when you're doing a talk is data philanthropy. Uh, this is the phrase, uh, I'm sure many of you know this already, I didn't. Uh, so a lot of the private companies, which are holders of information on people in various fields, you know, for their pur uh, private purposes. So they, in order to uh, sort of uh, do what is called corporate social responsibility, they said, well, we, we have a lot of data available with us on people. We are ready to share it. And so they are providing data for free to individuals they could do for public health organizations if they wanted as here's the data we have, what can you do with it and what is the good you can do with it. So that's data philanthropy. But we don't know what the, what the rules that the private organizations which want to donate data, what are the rules that they go by and what are the rules that we go by. So we, there needs to be some sort of harmonization between these. So, uh, I used privacy as an example uh, of an ethical concern around research based on social networking sites. Uh, and I think these concerns exist around other issues as well, for example, justice issues and autonomy issues, et cetera. We can go on. Uh, so I feel that the ethics framework for research that is based on social networking sites should be defined and specific guidance for researchers and all involved stakeholders should be developed. I think that's the message from my talk going through all the things. Thank you. I think that's the last. I have some resources. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Karina. Is she here? Oh, hi. <laughs> who helped me, who helped to put together some of the slides and then did a literature search for me. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sakina. It is very fascinating and uh, informative. Um, now, now I would like to uh, give the floor to my co-chair, Professor Bhattacharya, to chair the next session, question and answers. Please. Thank you, Jane. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, uh, we always thank the funding body, but today I think it's particularly important since the funding body has also contributed a wonderful speaker. Uh, thank you to, to all WHO colleagues who help us these, make these things possible. Delighted to see Najib here despite his hectic diary. Now, just a reminder, I think we have people online, so when you ask questions or make comments, please identify yourself. I'm Sanjoy. Um, uh, from the University of York, uh, because we'd like, this is recorded and then put in an archive. So it, it, this, this material is actually used for training purposes or educational purposes, and if you make a comment and someone listens to your interesting comment, you often get connections. People actually write to people who made comments and uh, for, to further research, so please do identify yourself. Um, I, Show the floor open for comments or questions. Dev, please. My name is Dev Ray. I'm a retiree. I used to work in WHO. I will probably ask a very, very silly or stupid question. Here, you are talking about the social media like Facebook and so on, and the data mining comes from those who are already on it. Can one reverse the process, in a sense, from these models, go further? I'll give you an example. Right now, we have this tremendous problem of Ebola. Now, I don't know, I'm sure many of you know Peter Piot. He has been claiming, and even yesterday in an interview he claimed, that this injection of American or British people there is not going to solve the problem. It has to be community-based identification and so on, which would probably lead to some sort of a containment. Now, this is a very interesting area where 
one asks the question, if we had, they don't in Liberia, Guinea, and so on, uh, wide dissemination of computers and Facebook, would the situation not have a reason? That is, would it have prevented it? Second, can we reverse the process from the social media, which is based on what exists, to something which can be done, which I think uh, Dr. Saxena had mentioned about uh, some sort of a self-identification of the, the target audience. Could that be reversed to apply some of these principles to have this community involvement leading to more containment and dissemination of information? So it may be a very silly question, but there it is. Hi, this is uh, Dr. Abbas Aksena. Uh, very interesting question, and yes, uh, can we use computers to fight viruses? And uh, I think it's, if we could, and or if Liberia and Guinea had been more interconnected computer-wise, uh, perhaps uh, the communication would have been much faster, better. People may have had less fears. People, could, there could have been communication, you know, the uh, communication groups which could have led the process to, you know, like social network analysis. And you could have used also, you could have used that to find out who are the people to target. <coughs> where can you make efforts into this? And so, yes, it would have been great. And I know that we have been trying efforts into uh, using uh, SMS messaging as a tool to, to improve communication and mass SMS. And that's also partly, it's, it's, a, it's in a way, it's a social network, uh, it's a social media. So, yes, it would have made a lot of difference, I think. Uh, and of course, I mean, you have both the things go hand in hand. Vaccines are important and they are necessary. They have to be developed, but you cannot forget what happened in the ground. So uh, I'm not sure I've answered your second question. And, uh, I Can we draw lessons from these, you know, the models that you have been describing? Uh, for instance, the social media network, like the various uh, studies you talked about, the diabetic connect and so on. Can one reverse it? to see how very quickly you can sort of disseminate the information without the need to have a wide dispersion of uh, tablets, computers in Liberia with, you know, Facebook and so on. Can one project it a little bit beyond to have a practical uh, value? Well, in a way, yes and no, because I would argue that the whole power of social media network is because of the involvement of the people who are on the social media. So you could have uh, you could have conversations from, I guess what you're saying is that you already have this knowledge and then you just feed it to people. It won't be theirs. They won't own it. It'll be something, oh, you gave it to me, but I don't know. And that is one of the problems in Liberia is that they see foreign doctors coming in and coming with their medicine and coming with those face shoots, et cetera, which is not part of their culture. They don't own it. And so they don't, they don't trust. Uh, Dan O'Connor, Welcome Trust. I think the, the answer is not necessarily um, more computers. But, and Abba mentioned SMS. It's, it's a cheap cell phone is, is how you can do this. You don't need to give everyone an Apple Mac in library. You need to give everyone a cheap cell phone that they can get SMSs on and from which they can send SMSs and, and, and do the self-reporting uh, that, that, uh, that is necessary to the, this kind of, of tracking. But that, that lack of um, data infrastructure, the lack of internet access, the slowness of the internet that APA talked about in Liberia and in West Africa can be seen just as a placeholder for the, the reason that Ebola has been so rampant there, which is that those are extraordinarily impoverished countries who, who lack robust public health networks. And places without robust public health networks also don't have robust internet networks. They don't have good roads. It's all part of um, uh, the, the same piece, I think. In talking about the reversal of it, and but Abba is absolutely right. Communities of practice and disease communities who have been very successful in using social media to um, improve health behaviors have always had ownership of the health messages that they are disseminating. 
there's a lot of very good work that's been done with um, the gay community, with um, MSM community about around HIV avoidance behaviors and, and safe sex behaviors, which has been done online through blogging, through community sites, through forums. And that's been successful because the men involved in that have felt like they own the messages, that it's come from their community. It's not some big doctor coming in and saying, this is how you do it. It's coming from them in partnership with doctors to ensure that the information is accurate, but it feels like it's, it's from their community. Uh, I'm Rajiv. I'm, I'm an intern from the Oral Health Unit. My question is quite simple. Research, uh, sorry, ethical dilemma in research is very universal whether whichever field it is applied being epidemiological or social or clinical research. And I assume ethical dilemmas also come up with social media research. So can you please tell me how to overcome ethical dilemmas in social um, media research? <laughs> Thank you. No. <laughs> uh, the way to overcome um, the, these dilemmas is, I think, precisely what Abha was saying at, at the end of it, that if there is going to be a framework or a set of guidelines, and it was just what I was saying about communities of practice, they have to come from social media users. They have to have iron. We can't just recreate the Belmont Commission or the Helsinki and just do a big report that comes from the top down because those communities who are exchanging health information online and who are trying to do their own research will feel completely excluded from that and will run away and will go as far away from it as possible and continue practicing what they're doing in potentially dangerous and harmful ways. So there's, no, there's not an answer of we do it by A, B, and C. We have to consider ourselves partners with um, upper mediaries. Like we're all, it's peer-to-peer -peer thing and it has to be done through the communities and in, in partnership with them. No, no, I agree. Um, but, and yes, we don't have guidelines. So when we do get occasional, in, luckily for us, or I don't know, luckily for us, we haven't had a lot of research protocols that are supported by WHO that uses social media as a way of research. Uh, we do have, I mean, if you, can, if you extend that to the use of mobile phones, we have a lot of research that's supported by mobile phones. And some of the issues that are raised are related to privacy and, and data ownership. Because uh, one of the concerns that the Ethics Committee of WHO has when you use SMSs, and therefore there is a data provider who's involved. And what is the ownership of the data that is with the data provider? And you said that you know, the, the, the websites that you were quoting, they, the, those data providers actually already say that we'll sell your data. But the phone companies don't. And they're actually the forgotten link. So one of the things that we have to remind researchers is please have a discussion with the data providers as to how they will protect the data that is being generated through the research. This colleague and friend, Dr. Human Moman, who used to coordinate global health histories as well, and I think he's writing in from Rio. Hello, human. Uh, and he says, people like to converse on social media in their mother tongues. What is the role of language bias and multilingualism in this area? I think it's the same as it is in any sort of research. When you identify, when you as a researcher identify a community with whom you want to work or with whom you feel are a likely cohort for research, you have to be aware of biases and how representative mm -hmm. they are. The, the language of the internet is English, whether we, we like it or not. Um, but it does then mean that um, potentially certain nuances and certain cultural subtleties can be lost. In, in the rubber bit. But as I, I've said before, the internet does have wide, wide global reach and you know, people in Brazil will be chatting in, in Portuguese and people in China will be chatting in, in Mandarin. And so I'm not sure that it has any greater bias or troubles that we have to be aware of than, than regular research would. I don't know if other you think that's the same. It depends on how the research is set up. So if it's not an EPO-mediated research, if it's the usual type of research or data mining or whatever we're doing, uh, then it will depend upon the research. If they decide to say, okay, we will use these, these languages to do our research, then of course you could get in, uh, information on that. There's a lot of these uh, 
uh, the lot of these uh, social network sites are actually, as you said, in, in local language. Mm -hmm. So I know now I can write to my mom in Hindi because uh, the uh, the WhatsApp allows me to have a Hindi uh, uh, font, and it's very easy to write, uh, which it wasn't earlier. But then somebody who wants to collect the data, they have to say, okay, we have to go to all the fonts that are available and all the languages that are available and see what we can find. But it's going to be more difficult. I think also that the when we talk about language bias as well, the particularly if we talk about patient-led research, not necessarily research on social media, but research from within social com media communities, those communities are quite self-selecting. These are often, for want of a better, better word, they're well-educated, they are people with the time and the cultural and economic resources to exchange their health information. They are from a sort of particular uh, demographic background. And so, as, as Abba rightly pointed out, there may be not deliberate exclusions, but the kind of cultural and social capital one needs to become part of a social media research community may very well exclude precisely the people who would benefit most from it. So we have another question online this time from India, from Dr. Mahesh Devnani, Assistant Professor of Hospital Administration at PGI-MER, Chandigarh, India. And he says, hi, Dan, you mentioned that people are voicing against being used for research on social media. I think in addition to ethics, there are some legal issues as well. Are there any countries having laws on research based on data from social media? Uh, hello, Mahesh, and thank you for following me on Twitter, which I've just seen on my phone. Um, isn't it spooky how not, he's there, he is in India, and here I am in Geneva. Which is great. Um, the legal issues, uh, 28 days, we need 28 years to do the, the legal issues uh, uh, around social media. My own uh, expertise is within the um, United States, is where I was based for most of it, and the, the, there is no direct sort of legal comprehension of uh, how social media works. Now, American research regulation is governed uh, by uh, uh, their, their, their laws there, and they're looking at reevaluating human subjects regulation in the United States right now, and very, very little of even these reconsiderations touches on social media at all. Um, they really sort of haven't got to grips with it. Um, the European Union has quite a lot of laws around privacy. Germany has, got, has very much spearheaded this around being very critical of Facebook and Google and the way they use privacy. But particular laws about social media, I don't know. Most of them tend to come back to extant privacy laws and how they might be applied. The problem is figuring out who is the object of the legal challenge, because these are multinational global companies who may not actually have legal standing in your country. So if you're trying to regulate it, it turns out you know, the servers are in a completely different country and they're not regulable. Hi, I'm, Pas oh, sorry. Um, I'm Pasqualina from, I'm an intern here, but I'm a public health doctor from Australia. And I apologise for the overlap slightly with some previous questions. Um, but I just have a small vignette which I'd appreciate your opinion on. In Darwin, where I'm from, we had an outbreak of syphilis in the, um, in the homosexual male population uh, earlier in the year. And the CDC there um, combated it in quite a novel approach using Grindr. So Grindr is um, an app, for those who don't know, that's um, used by homosexual males, it's the number one in Australia at least for um, organising rendezvous, so they arrange for a pop-up message to come on warning about the syphilis outbreak. In the subsequent quarter of the year there was no new syphilis um, outbreaks or cases, so in that respect it was good. However, when they're now presenting this data, and because it's quite novel, everyone wants to hear about it, so I assume it's going to get printed up and go to many um, presentations. They obviously have had to get the amount of people using Grindr, how many people clicked on it in this weekend, they know how many people like per capita. So all this information now about a certain, I mean, none of it's at any individual level, but it's about a certain type of people in our community, none of whom consented to anything, and this information's now just out there. So I suppose my question is, I mean, um, Dr. Lana, you were talking about boundaries, and how do you get the boundary between, you know, what is a really effective public health initiative but actually thinking about who you're actually targeting and, and whose information is it. I, I think that's what, it's, you know, it's privately public or publicly private. It's, um, you're not naming people, but you're identifying communities. 
I don't think we have the answers to the the what regulations are are, are, are bound, you know, are, are uh, affecting this. So I, I'm not sure. I don't know whether I see nothing wrong in doing this. I think it was a huge uh, it was a huge public health uh, success. Um, I don't know if it was uh, if it has any ethical dimensions or not. Um, I would be. I, I don't think personally I would have a big problem with it, but it needs to have a greater analysis to see. I'm sure there must be some issues that I've overlooked. I'd just take a moment to commemorate the first mention of Grinder at the WHO. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, the interesting thing about that, and it, it's very similar to some of the, 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 the things I was talking about with the, the, the gay community online previously, who, the, the Grinder thing was a success precisely because there is a, uh, a, there's a behavioral profile of certain Grinder users that, know, and it's acknowledged by, by those users, and the, the CDC worked with Grinder. What would have been absolutely crashingly bad is if the CDC had created sock puppet Grinder. Um, Profiles and gone around on Grinder saying, "Hey, don't get syphilis." That, but it was an official message from Grinder from the community. So it had community buy-in from the beginning, and that's how that sort of public health intervention succeeds. Um, what we have to be careful about, though, is things like that is overkill. If you're going on Grinder to hook up, basically, which is what it's for, it's for casual sexual rendezvous. And every time you go on there, you see another message about syphilis or HIV. You're going to go to another social network where they don't have those messages. Um, you've got to remember when you're at public health, uh, trying to do public health interventions, um, the aim of those communities is not actually public health. So you have to ensure that your intervention um, syncs with their, the, the aims of those communities. And if your intervention starts to upset the aims of that community, they will either remove you or go somewhere else and, and start all over again. But I don't think it has, I don't think there's much identifiability issues. And I'm, I'm very excited to see when they do write that up, whether they write it up as research or as an experimental intervention and, and which way around they do it. Um, Shamila Souza, intern at the ePortuguese and PhD student from São Paulo, Brazil, and King's College London. Um, so at, at King's, uh, well, specifically Department of uh, Social Science, Health and Medicine, we hear many talks about um, lay expertise by citizenship and citizen science, which is some of the issues that are uh, big labels for some of uh, the issues that we talked here today. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went here at WHO at a workshop on Evipnet, Evipnet, and I asked a question about how public policymakers feel about evidence that comes from citizen science research base. And they said it's not, they don't, they don't rely much on it because of all the intricacies of this type of results. So my question is, um, what is the input on how do you think that uh, ethical guidelines and regulations on citizen science or patient-led research could change this perception in the view of uh, policymakers? Thank you. I think I'm slightly uh, we keep saying regulation, which has this sort of slightly deadening um, discursive quality to it. I think the, the reason that policymakers are shy away from citizen science produced data is that they basically um, don't think it has sort of statistical significance or validity because these are not trained statisticians or researchers, and the, the results they um, the results they produce don't have good p-values. They don't have like good data. They don't have good protocols behind them. That's that's the worry. Um, so instead of talking about regulating that citizen science, I think what, we, what would be best for us to do, because there's such huge opportunities there to use these systems who are really excited about sharing their data, is to enable the citizen science in a much better way and to give people who want to, be, want to participate in APA-mediated peer-to-peer -peer research the tools and access to the structures, to the scientific and research structures that will enable them to do the research in a way that is recognizable and acceptable by public policymakers and scientists. And that's exactly what patients like me did with the ALS thing. The ALS patients like me had this idea, but <laughs> patients like me allowed them to get access to some scientists to help them think how this algorithm would work. 
patients like me enable them to get access to a private ethical review board, we went over it. Because without the good statistician, without the ethical review, you can't get published, right? And so they end up getting published in Nature, Biotech, right? Which is an amazing journal. I wish I could get published in that. Um, and so it's about enabling this research. And by enabling them to get access to the structures and the legitimacy, that's how we enable it to, we enable that, um, the opportunity. Uh, that's how we make the most of it. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the way to go. Um, I am just a bit hesitant right now because uh, the whole thing about, and I don't know enough about citizen science or about the apple-mediated world, but I would imagine that the reason that people take part in this is because they feel that ownership and they feel like it's their thing. Uh, and I agree that this needs to be backed up by good science, otherwise uh, it will not be... Uh, appreciated and it will not even be taken up by anybody. On the other hand, you put in a bunch of researchers and scientists to, to this, they may actually hijack the agenda. So there is this whole issue about how do you continue to have the focus on, particip you know, on uh, citizen-led science and still, allow, you know, still continue to let them have the ownership uh, and still have the scientific uh, uh, integrity in a way also how do you how do you avoid turning them into researchers <laughs> um, hi my name is Susanna Robinson I'm a consultant here at WHO on M health so exactly on this how to use mobile phones um, so I was wondering, it actually builds on what's been said here from the point of view of kind of community-based participation and having buy-in from the community in terms of how to actually create this framework for how to regulate ethics. Might there be an idea to actually borrow an idea from this era and use crowdsourcing on these sites and basically from the bottom up build some sort of network where collaboration from the users themselves creates a sort of selection of ideas on how to regulate this which can then be proposed to the policymakers who will then have the kind of top-down power to actually put it into effect. Yes, absolutely. I think crowdsourcing would be the, it would seem like the natural way to go about uh, engaging social media communities in the creation of um, guidelines or, or, or regulations or enabling structures that they will feel ownership of. And I, I think personally, and there are various, there are actually examples already within community, not necessarily health communities, but the, the sort of casual communities around uh, you know, around music or literature or books or film or sports, who do create their own rules and regulations for what you're allowed to talk about in which forum, what results in being banned from a forum and things like that. And so the people are used to making up their own rules on the internet. Um, the, the, the thing to think about, is, I suppose the, the only sort of block to that is there are always some people in some communities who want to be more involved than others and so who may potentially come to dominate crowdsourcing efforts because they have more pull or more influence. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just about being, uh, being aware of the, the limits of crowdsourcing as a democratic uh, structure, but it's definitely, I think, it seems like the natural fit. I think you're absolutely right. Hi, I'm Andreas Reis from WHO's Global Health Ethics uh, Unit. And my question goes, um, along similar lines as previous ones about uh, governance and, and legal structures. And um, I really wonder, you know, what could be a potential mechanism for, um, you know, litigation or in case of problems. So if, for example, uh, take your study on lithium. So what if this had gone wrong, the dosage would have been completely off and some people seriously harmed. So, you know, what could be potential mechanisms to for oversight or for, for uh, regulating these kind of experiments or research. Question, but who would who would uh, sue whom? Because if I decide to take lithium on my own, who would I sue? So maybe you. I mean, there must be other issues. This is precisely it. When it is peer-to-peer and -peer mediated, and when subjects are researchers. It's very difficult. You can't put a regulatory structure in place to protect yourself from yourself. So when you fail to wear a seatbelt and you crash your car and you injure yourself, who 
do you sue at that point? It's very much that, that same sort of thing. What you would potentially be able to do with your family if you died or something is like look at who supplied you the lithium or who gave you a car with a faulty seatbelt. So it would be actually about the, the, the supply of things. And this, this is the thing, like we've sort of talked about this like it's an exciting world where anyone can do any kind of research. Do you want, you're not going to be able to do a chemotherapy study via Facebook, right? Because you, by law, cannot get access to the chemotherapy drugs, right? Those are regulated. So there are already the regulatory and legal structures in place that will probably suffice for any kind of um, uh, legal challenge to, around safety. Sorry, um, but this would place a lot of the burden and onus on the individual, right? And often the research ethics committees look at things like informed consent, you know, will there be enough information to make an informed decision and so forth. Um, and I mean, you're basically arguing that's maybe not necessary in this kind of uh, uh, setting, but the harms may be equally, you know, uh, uh, grave. I, I, would not say that I'm arguing that informed consent isn't necessary as for the sort of to, to ensure that a, a piece of patient-led research is ethical. What I am saying is that the structures by which we guarantee informed consent may be different within those things. If you have someone who is perhaps taking lithium and doing the thing, um, isn't necessarily informed consent the right way to do it because how do you, you've written the protocol, of course you know what's going to go on, do you, you know the thing, and you have a vested interest in knowing the risks uh, and benefits of it. So consent and information is, is absolutely key, but it's how you go about ensuring it is not necessarily going to be the same. Uh, thank you, just, just a comment, uh, great talk, thanks very much. I, I would like to draw back to this Oh, hi. I'm Nitita from Service Delivery and Safety. I just would like to come back to the issue you talk about, you know, confidentiality and privacy. In our area, in patient safety, for example, and also draw back to the citizen side that you mentioned, um, the evidence on patient engagement and patient stories still thin on the literature. They're coming out a lot now at the studies. But for people, it is, they, they are determined to use their stories, the story of their experience with adverse events, as a way to access policy makers and healthcare providers. And they insist that evidence starts from one person. This is my story, the story is real. So they use their stories. The issue we have and um, uh, um, encounter often is that they actually don't like to be anonymous. They would like to put their name on their stories, and that is actually uh, so. The, the current rules and you know all those things you know require us to protect their privacy and things. But they said no. We insist we want our name on our court. So I think maybe that's a new dimension for the ethics to consider. I, I, I think that's right. What's very interesting about the, the, the world of, of patient safety is, as, as well as those the, the, the demand to own your own story which you know, ethnographers and, and sociologists have encountered that, 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 that problem for years when people have, um, uh, people who've suffered uh, sexual violence, for example, or um, have been part of uh, conflict situations who have asked sociologists and ethnographers, why are you anonymizing me? That sounds like I'm ashamed of my story. And I'm not, and I want to own the story, and ownership of the story is part of the recovery process. But the other side of, of, of another aspect from patient safety is that there is an idea about obligation and duty, that you as a patient potentially have the obligation to share your data about your adverse event or about your experience of a particular uh, healthcare intervention. And this is where the excitement and the, uh, the sort of uh, the cheerleading for social media and research can actually shade, I think, a little bit into, into the, more, the more negative side. Because if the future of healthcare is around, or healthcare research is around people sharing their data, so it's really quick and fast, do we all suddenly have to do it? Do you, will you start to lose out on certain advances? Will you be obliged by your government, by your healthcare insurer, to share all your data? Because if you don't share it, you're actually slowing down the speed of research. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the Diabetic Connect Network up there. The diabetes community, particularly in North America, is absolutely leading the way in terms of, sort of self-management of chronic conditions using uh, social media. 
But one of the worries that people have there is that doctors are now going, oh, well, there's a website. Let's go and use the website. I do not, I have let, the states can then sort of abdicate responsibility for you because there's a community. And so empowerment, which we're all very excited about, we want people to be part of this exciting world, can very easily shade over into governments, insurers, employers, abdicating responsibility mm -hmm. for providing your health care. And that's something we have to be very, very careful about. It's, I'm a huge fan of social media, and I think it's extraordinarily powerful to change healthcare, but that has to be watched for and observed, I think, at all times. I think that's a, that, that's a great point, because in the end, uh, a community of users, so a patient is following up, and that's the advice he got in the community of his community, whatever it was, and ends up with a complication. And then the doctors will say, well, that's your community. You go back to them, and I can't help you, or whatever, or the insurers will not give you. So I think that's a huge risk. Yes. Uh, may I ask the last question, Sanjay? Uh, um, how is conflict of interest policed in all this? It's not. <laughs> it's not policed very well at all. Um, there is um, there. I, I, um, when, when Jing introduced me, she mentioned that I'd worked as a, a social media consultant. I was in social media very early on, from 2007, working largely in the commercial sector. And some of the big brands and organizations used to create fake social media presences, right? To do what we, so where there is grassroots organizations, what they were doing was astroturfing. It was faking it. Once you're found out to fake it, your brand value goes down. It's terrible. There are examples and stories that have not been properly published yet of drug companies and researchers doing similar things within disease communities, of pushing particular studies and particular treatments within healthcare communities. They're very quickly found out um, by the communities themselves, but it's not, um, it's, not it, it, it's the sort of thing that, that, that does happen. The other flip of it is conflict of interest um, comes back to the informed consent thing. You as a participant slash researcher have an interest in the success of the protocol. And so there's a worry that people will be blind to the risk because you're so desperate for success. But you also have a vested interest in not dying. Right, as a person, so you, there is a conflict there, right, between how far you want the science to do well, but also how far you actually don't want to be in pain because you've ingested some terrible substance. Um, again, these are it's uh, that old history phrase: it's new wine in old bottles. Well, absolutely delighted with today's discussion. Wonderful mix of WHO department officials and interns are working in your departments. Just the perfect mix. Uh, I'd again like to thank both the speakers for their time and their efforts and for coming over to Geneva. None of this would have been possible for me without Jing's support. She's been a tremendous support. Uh, and again, thank you to Miriam and all our WHO colleagues and Alex who runs the show with Miriam and Jing from York. So thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Join us again next month.